This video was sponsored by Campfire Blaze. Insert flaming joke here. Warning, this video uses the word queer in a reclaimed way like a whole bunch, like I say it more than a hundred times. If that upsets you, you probably won't have a good time watching this video, and I'm kind of questioning why you even clicked on it. Okay, here we go. The Motion Picture Production Code of 1930, more commonly known as the Hayes Code, was a set of self-censorship industry guidelines that basically defined what movies were allowed to do. It covers a lot of ground, but broadly it puts forward and enforces the following three general principles. One, no picture shall be produced that will lower the moral standards of those who see it. Hence, the sympathy of the audience should never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil, or sin. Two, correct standards of life, subject only to the requirements of drama and entertainment, shall be presented. And three, law, natural or human, shall not be ridiculed, nor shall sympathy be created for its violation. And to be honest, I could stop the video here. This, this right here, is the chemical formula for the queer-coded villainy trope. Between 1934 and 1968, this standard was strongly enforced in U.S. film production down to the letter. Your movie could not portray sin or violations of the natural law in any kind of sympathetic context, which means if you wanted to put queer stuff in your movie, your only option was to put it on a bad guy. The Hayes Code also prohibited things like masculine women, feminine men, and interracial relationships. Uh, the 30s through 60s. But it's not like the Hayes Code invented the idea that these things were bad. The concept that queerness is some kind of unnatural crime or sin instead of just being, you know, a way people can exist is pretty old and well established at this point, but more importantly than the whole discrimination and criminalization thing, for decades if not centuries in the US and UK, the most popular attitude towards that sparkling rainbow of human diversity was that it was a thing, sure, but nobody was allowed to acknowledge it. You couldn't be upfront or overt about queer tendencies, those were private and shameful and you would be super arrested and punished if you were caught being queer too loudly. It's not that these identities didn't exist or weren't known about, it's that they were mostly obscured, actively punished, or most commonly referred to with obfuscating polite euphemisms to discreetly imply that someone was queer without making any concrete statements that would violate the sweeping agreement that these people's very existence was fundamentally indecent, embarrassing, or otherwise a problem to be covered up or fixed. Men weren't gay, they were confirmed bachelors. That woman isn't partnered with that man because they're mutually covering up their own queer identities by giving each other plausible deniability while seeing people they're actually attracted to on the side, they're just in a lavender marriage. Those two independently wealthy New England women aren't living together because they're lesbians, they're just in a Boston marriage. That woman who never seemed interested in getting married or settling down isn't asexual or aromantic or a lesbian, she's a spinster. That guy who publicly stated he was bisexual was probably just joking. This person who dressed and lived publicly as a man their whole life and took great pains to make sure nobody found out they weren't assigned male at birth wasn't a trans man, maybe they were just really committed to going to medical school. It's not automatically this queer thing, so it's totally kosher. It's all about the plot plausible deniability, baby. Basically all this to say that while queer identities have always existed and always been known to a degree, until very recently the prevailing attitude was that they had to be kept secret and private, and any kind of publicly visible queerness had to be smacked down as harshly as possible. This attitude manifested in lots of different ways. Some people treated it like a sin that people had a religious obligation to oppose in all its forms, while some people took the slightly more charitable attitude that it wasn't inherently a problem as long as they kept it quiet and consensual and not in my backyard and don't ask, don't tell. Of course, in practice, this was not true. For instance, Alan Turing and Oscar Wilde were both famously punished absolutely horrendously for private consensual relationships with other men. And while Turing was a very private guy, Oscar Wilde is kind of famous for being flamboyant and a historical queer icon. But even he kept his actual queer relationships on the DL as much as possible, actually taking the Marquess of Queensbury to court for libel when he accused him of sleeping with his son, which by all accounts Wilde was doing. Unfortunately, during that case, Wilde's gay relationships were exposed by a team of private detectives which flipped the case on its head and turned the whole trial into a sham, after which his life was basically systematically destroyed. First he denied everything, but when he was arrested and tried after pleading not guilty, he ended up undercutting himself by delivering a heartbreakingly beautiful defense of the love that dare not speak its name, and how that kind of love between two men is perfectly natural, beautiful, and noble, dating back to ancient Greece, and it's not the fault of the love that the modern world doesn't understand it. It was, unfortunately, kind of the opposite of a legal defense, and he ended up doing two years of hard labor and was never the same afterwards, actually dying shortly after his release. This is a very long and depressing way to say that the real world social context for the corpus of literature that created the queer-coded villain trope was an environment where queerness was known and acknowledged as what amounted to an open secret, but the minute the social contract was violated and queerness was publicly acknowledged or exposed, it was violently punished for being indecent, unnatural, or wrong. 
anyone, despite demonstrably being none of those things. God, calling someone out for public indecency when you had to hire a team of private detectives to find them out would be so funny if it hadn't ruined so many lives. So, this is the fertile soil that gave rise to the Hayes Code, which put down on paper the principles that most people had been operating on for decades already. People were impressionable, media influenced reality, and it was very important for that media to be ideologically pure so as to promote good morals and traditional values and buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. Basically, between this and the prevailing attitude towards queerness, popular media gave queer identities the same two options that reality did hide their existence as much as possible, or expose their existence and suffer. With the added moralistic flavoring that queerness was an inherently evil or sinful thing that could not be glorified under any circumstances, the wonderful world of fictional moral absolutism meant that your heroes could not be queer in any way, but your villains could, as long as they were suitably punished in the end. From this primordial media soup arises the queer coded villain in all their glory. Everything taboo and indecent in reality embodied totally unsubtly on the silver screen. Men who are visibly effeminate, women who are visibly masculine, villains who are actively hypersexual, acting in publicly suggestive ways towards people who their attraction to is totally unacceptable. This media made no distinction between traits that were currently socially unacceptable and traits that were fundamentally evil, so villains got their pick of the pack while heroes tended to be extremely bland. But the Hayes Code really only lasted about 30 years, and near the end there it was already being pretty thoroughly lambasted because it was, you know, stupid. It held all of American cinema to the moral standard of a Care Bears episode, not to mention it treated audiences like gullible morons who would see an ounce of moral complexity on screen and become so tilted it would lead to the immediate downfall of civilization. And from their perspective on what defines civilization, they might have been right. Forcing an audience to exclusively consume media that conforms to a fundamentally false moral dichotomy is pretty much the only way to keep that audience buying that moral dichotomy. If movies were allowed to show queer characters that weren't evil villains, it might make the audience think that being queer was actually totally fine and harmless. And hey, look where we are now. Progress. Most people agree that the final nail in the Hayes Code coffin was Some Like It Hot, a wildly successful comedy where two musicians dress in drag to escape the mafia and end up in a whole mess of gender-bending romantic shenanigans completely unacceptable by the Hayes Code standards. In the final scene of the movie, one of the musicians exasperatedly reveals to his smitten would-be suitor that he's a guy, to which the man replies, well, nobody's perfect, and keeps driving. But yeah, the Hayes Code gradually faded into obscurity, but that doesn't mean the tropes it fostered just went away. The queer-coded villain trope that grew in this basic moralized environment persisted even after the social context that created it began to wither. 1969 saw the turning point of the Stonewall riots, while the 70s saw the first organized pride parades and broadly heralded the beginning of the transition to where we are now. Queer identities being publicly acknowledged and celebrated has become the mainstream attitude, while bigotry is considered the embarrassing, unfortunate reality best swept under the rug. Of course, a simple turn of the tables this is not, because while the trait of queerness is inherent, the trait of being an asshole is selective. Look, I know some people are terrible, alright? I don't mind. I just need them to not be terrible around me, okay? But while society may have been marching on, tropes tend to be a little slow to change. There's momentum to literary movements, and since creators are largely inspired by the works of earlier creators, generational tropes can manifest where a new wave of creators produce a new wave of an earlier trope that they previously internalized. Queer-coded villains underwent a somewhat subtle shift around this time, and I'm not entirely sure where it came from, but I have a hunch. See, queer-coded villains, despite being the most generic, dag-nasty evil they can be, are often very beloved by fans and creators alike. This cannot have been true when the trope started, since the whole purpose of the Hayes Code was to make sure to portray these characters as negatively as possible so nobody in the audience got any funny ideas. But just by making these characters flamboyantly, unapologetically themselves, even if it was so they could be punished by the narrative for doing those things, the characters often ended up resonating with the audience, and not just the closeted queer audience. Defying the social order to unapologetically exist is the kind of personal narrative that can resonate with anyone who doesn't comfortably 100% fit into the social order, whatever it may be. Those three decades worth of Hayes Code approved queer coded villains might have been intended to enforce the status quo, but their transgressive nature still taught the audience that the status quo could be disrupted. Somewhere along the line, I think this transformed the trope itself. The focus of the character was no longer on how evil and debauched they were, it was on how they existed in a fundamentally transgressive way, a trait that a surprising number of people can sympathize with. Now, I may not know exactly when this first manifested, but I know when it got big, and it's all thanks to Disney. Classic archetypical Disney villains are frequently queer-coded, the most blatant example being Ursula, whose visual design was completely based on famous drag queen Divine. But most Disney villains were a combination of flamboyant, immensely self-confident, and in some way fundamentally transgressive. Even the male villains who are explicitly attracted to women don't avoid being queer-coded with traits like vanity or a general love of drama that are associated with femininity or the broad space of queer stereotypes. And these characters are beloved. Well, maybe not Gaston. But they're almost always the most interesting people in their movies, and even if we know that they're gonna lose in the end, it's still very fun to watch them sweep around like they own the place, singing about how diabolical they are. Now, there's one problem here. 
it's not easy nailing down what exact traits constitute queer coding, so it's hard to definitively argue that a given character is queer coded or not. But like all coding, queer coding draws on the corpus of stereotypes. If something is a queer stereotype, applying it to a character can make them queer coded. For instance, Disney's portrayal of Hades has a few traits in common with the sassy gay best friend type. Scar, despite being, you know, a lion has some flamboyant body language that makes a lot of people think, hmm, kinda gay. Captain Hook is very flamboyant and swishy, and his whole thing with Smee is, well, a thing. Cruella de Vil is a powerful, bossy older woman with a husband who's never named and a ridiculously over-the-top personality, and she's just got this vibe, you know? And this one's kind of interesting. A lot of Disney villains express a general skepticism or detached amusement about the obligatory romantic subplot between the mandatory heterosexual couple of pretty young heroes, from eye-rolling all the way up to dismissing the existence of true love. This is less of a behavioral queer stereotype and more tied in with the actual queer experience of feeling fundamentally separated from the concept of a fairy tale love story happy ending. Disney villains are usually placed in ideological opposition to the straight romance in their movies. Ursula casually tells Ariel to seduce Prince Eric by relying on her looks and the importance of body language rather than, like, getting to know each other as people. Jafar tries to use genie magic to make Jasmine love him to completely undercut her whole narrative about being free to choose, which is actually interesting because Aladdin actually spends most of the movie also trying to manipulate Jasmine because he's afraid she could never love the real him. Gaston seemingly can't conceive of a paradigm where people might like people for reasons deeper than physicality and thus might not be into him. Hades actively manipulates Hercules by using his love for Megara as his weakness, and Maleficent's whole evil plan is based on the idea that true love's kiss will never happen. Disney villains consistently either dismiss true love or reduce it to physical attraction. Classic Disney villains are disconnected from the concept of true love in a way that could resonate pretty well with an audience that grew up with no love stories they could personally relate to. This is a bit of a reach, I know, but it is a common experience that might help explain why this specific flavor of queer-coded villain resonates as well as it does. Now, of course, as we've discussed earlier, queer subjects have become a lot less taboo in the last few decades. Queer coding still has happens on the regular, but we're also getting canon queer representation, and these tropes have been interacting in very strange ways. Plenty of media has been adding positive representation, where heroes are allowed to be canonically queer on screen. But the queer-coded villain is such a well-established trope at this point that some creators feel safer making villains explicitly queer than heroes. Shades of that old moral absolutism are still there. Heroes are heroic and positive role models, and giving them character traits that are not unilaterally regarded as positive can be seen as a risky play. I briefly touched on this in the anti-hero video, too, because it's easier for a writer to give an anti-hero a potentially spicy character trait like a queer identity because it feels like less of a gamble. And this pervasive fear is responsible for a whole bunch of tropes in this space. Bury your gaze, for instance, is the trope where a canon queer character dies fairly quickly, often shortly after their orientation or identity is officially confirmed. And this happens because, frankly, a lot of writers feel safer when their controversial characters are dead. They get to reap the positive cloud of acknowledging that this identity exists, but they don't need to worry about actually handling the character well. Of course, bury your gaze is a long-standing trope also rooted in the Hays Code, since pun punishing immorality was a huge part of the whole premise, so killing off queer characters was the respectable thing for these movies to do. Same stuff, different decade. Queer baiting is a comparatively new trope in this general space, as it's queer coding with an inherently positive angle. A creator will hint to the audience that canon positive queer content might be coming in order to draw in an audience that wants to see that kind of representation, and then sometimes they deliver the barest bit of canon queer content before snapping the camera away and often killing the character just to be safe. Reap the brownie points of acknowledging queer stuff as a thing, but don't actually write it into your story in any meaningful way, because that's hard and scary and people might get mad. Queer baiting is queer coding for people who want more queer content, and it's harmful in all the same ways. For some writers, queer coding and queer baiting can feel like a safe alternative to actual queer representation. You never need to worry about actually writing the queer content if you just keep hinting at it or dropping in stereotypes the audience can read into. On some level, we've circled back around to confirmed bachelors and lavender weddings and plausible deniability because queer identities haven't quite shaken off that veneer of social unacceptability that makes people nervous or ashamed to touch on them in any serious way. Modern queer coded villains still have a lot of the baggage from the original Hays Code version, like how their queerness will sometimes be used to signal that they're extra unhinged or dangerous, tying back into the idea that it's something inherently abnormal and alarming. And certain identities get most of their on-screen representation by way of queer-coded villains. Most non-binary characters these days are explicitly non-human beings, like genderless aliens or shapeshifters. Bisexuality and pansexuality get most of their rep through very promiscuous characters, often with cheating subplots. And if you're asexual or aromantic, most of your good rep comes from robots, and the rest of your rep comes from evil villains in capable of understanding what it is to truly love. Now, before I so yeah and sign off, a whole bunch of other YouTubers have made videos related to this that you might want to check out. Lindsay Ellis's Tracing the Roots of Pop Culture Transphobia video is an extremely in-depth look at one very specific side of the queer-coded villain trope and how trans-coded villainy specifically evolved, while Sarah Zed's The John Locke Conspiracy and Dusty Elgate videos talk about queer baiting in BBC's Sherlock and the CW's Supernatural, respectively. H Bomber Guy's Sherlock is Garbage and Here's Why video also has a fun bit discussing BBC Sherlock's portrayal of Moriarty and how they deliberately queer-coded him to make him seem scarier and more unhinged 
unhinged, which is, you know, exactly what we were talking about today. Dominic Noble's Lost in Adaptation video about the 1945 The Picture of Dorian Gray also briefly touches on the Hayes Code and how it might have led them to reduce the queer coding of Dorian to make him more redeemable by their standards. There's also, like, a million videos and podcasts about Disney villains being queer coded queens, so yeah, have fun with that. It's a lot. <laughs> a lot. So, yeah, and thanks again to Campfire Blaze for sponsoring this video. As you may know, Campfire Blaze is a browser-based tool suite designed to help writers and world builders write and world build. You can keep your world and story private if you want, or you can collaborate with other writers in real time if that's more your speed. Campfire Blaze lets you write in browser with the manuscript module and automatically saves your project in the cloud, and the auto-tagging feature pops up details from your world building you might have missed or forgotten. Campfire Blaze also has dedicated tools for fleshing out locations, maps, cultures, species, magic systems, and more, so you can make a well-rounded world that fits your story. It also comes with 13 genre-based themes to set the mood, like fantasy, sci-fi, and romance, plus a custom theme creator if you want to build your own. Campfire Blaze's free version is already solid, but if you want extra fanciness, you can build your own tool suite and only pay for the modules you need, which run as low as 50 cents each. You can also unlock everything for just a few dollars a month with a 30-day return policy if you change your mind. Check out the link in the description, and make sure to use the promo code OSP21 for 20% off a lifetime purchase of Campfire Blaze.